Good morning, everyone. Uh, can everybody uh, hear us okay? All right. Uh, and I want to take the opportunity to introduce my colleague, uh, Dr. Bradford Owen, who's joining us from Cal State San Bernardino in San Bernardino. Hello from California, everyone. Nice to be with you. All right. Um, so good morning, everyone. And um, I, this is only the third session. And uh, I've learned so much in the first two sessions. This is a worth, uh, worthwhile conference to come to Puerto Rico for. And I appreciate the presenters, uh, my own colleagues uh, in many instances, and, and the things that I've learned from them uh, so far in this conference. And the energy of this conference is great. I uh, appreciate all the presenters and the organizers uh, for organizing this conference in Puerto Rico this year. So um, the topic of our conversation is uh, COVID-19, the pandemic of opportunities. My role at Cal State San Bernardino is Vice President of Information Technology Services. And uh, I, uh, my organization, uh, my colleagues like Brad and others, uh, joined together in providing world-class technology support and services to the entire university. And uh, you know, we have, we have a really, really good organization. We're very fortunate to have colleagues uh, in Information Technology Services that really care about our students. And that's really uh, fundamental to the success of uh, the initiatives at Cal State San Bernardino. You walk into our university, everybody's talking about the students. And our president always says, uh, it's all about the students. And that kind of mindset promulgates through everything that we do. Uh, we do everything for student success. And we as technologists use technologies to support the student success. Long before the pandemic started, we were technologically savvy. Uh, we had lots of online quality online courses. Uh, uh, Dr. Kalavid in his uh, remarks in the plenary session mentioned, we have about five or six online programs. A lot of our faculty were doing online courses, quality, the instructional designers work every day with our faculty members, but the adoption rate was not very high. In fact, um, only 50% of our faculty even used a learning management system. <laughs> We use Blackboard, and uh, we are in the process of transitioning to Canvas, and only 50% uh, of the faculty use any learning management system. And we had the infrastructure, we had the support available, but there wasn't the adoption. That, uh, and we were working hard with our faculty members to really uh, at least have them do hybrid, because to, we need to meet the students where they are in terms of their learning process. So then March 20th struck and it was pandemonium all over. The governor mm -hmm. of California announced that uh, we're gonna uh, go work from home and everybody was sent home. Uh, all the faculty, staff and students were sent home. And um, the first couple of weeks, we were just trying to figure out how to deliver the training and the services to our students, faculty and staff in a remote environment. One of the things we realized um, when we went in uh, was that we, the students, faculty and staff didn't have equitable access to technology training and resources. So um, all along we've been saying to our students, faculty and staff, come to campus, we will get you the best technology possible. We will give you the best service possible. But when they went home from the campus, we really didn't know what their home environment looked like, what they had access to, whether they had access to computers, internet, and did they have a good place to study. We didn't know anything about their home environment because that's not what our place was at that time. But when we sent everybody home, we really found out how our students, faculty and staff, didn't have access to computers, didn't have access to connectivity. So that was the first thing that we started to concentrate on. And we needed to quite focus on equity in terms of availability of technology equipment, software, and training for our students. We launched a laptop lending program. We launched a hotspot lending program for students, faculty, and staff who lived in places where they, they didn't have access to good internet connectivity. We, um, many of our presenters mentioned uh, in the plenary panel that they had to uh, fortify the Wi-Fi in the parking lots um, and surrounding areas so students could, could come in their cars and access the internet. All that we did, um, we have a campus, we have a Palm Desert campus, which is 70 miles away from San Bernardino. 
and we had to provide those same services to those students. So one of the phenomenon we, we, uh, we gave every student who wanted a laptop a laptop. We, want, we gave everybody, every student that wanted a hotspot a hotspot, but we still had students showing up in the parking lot by numbers. They were sitting in the parking structure in their cars and they were attending classes and they were consuming their education online. That's a phenomenon we just could not understand. But we're like, hey, we're not asking any questions. You like to be in the parking lot. And we found out that students didn't have a really good environment at home because their parents were working, their uh, siblings were taking classes at the same time. They might have a small apartment or a house that they really couldn't quietly sit and study or take classes. And that's why they were showing up in numbers in, the, in our parking lot. So we said, whatever you want to do, we will support it because we want to focus on, on an equitable outcome for you. And um, the Palm Desert student, one of the great things that happened is the Palm Desert student camp students could take all the courses that were offered in the San Bernardino campus during this time. Before it was, they were only uh, able to access courses that were offered in the Palm Desert campus because it's 70 miles away and some of the students took the shuttle to come to the San Bernardino campus. But when we went online, those courses were completely available for our, and our students. And then uh, technology training was another thing. It's one thing to have uh, computers and equipment, but if you didn't have the fluency, the digital fluency and literacy, and many of our students, faculty and staff lacked that, um, that was a problem. So the ITS training services, Jeanette Flores' organization uh, launched hundreds of training programs for students on how to use Zoom and how to use those technology tools and Dr. Owen and the instructional designers, uh, Mauricio Kadavid, who's our senior instructional designer, their team launched tons of courses for faculty, not only on the use of Zoom and other technology tools, but also how to engage students in a very pedagogical mode, uh, way using these technology tools. So um, some of the uh, technology accelerations we did for example, we were developing a chatbot, right? We were like, oh, we have a two-year roadmap to, to develop chatbots. All of a sudden, you know, uh, we accelerated that innovation. And here it says 25,000 questions were answered. Within, this was within the first three months of launching the chatbot. 25,000 queries were answered by the chatbots on various different topics. How do I access financial aid? To how do I access technology support? How can I get a laptop? You ask the chatbot, where can I get coffee? It'll show you to the nearest Starbucks. Chatbot is a little biased towards Starbucks, which I don't like that much. You know, I think there's McDonald's coffee is better than Starbucks. <laughs> but, you know, that's what our chatbot did. Um, we re-engineered forms and processes, uh, over 300 forms. Everything, technology adoption had to be accelerated. Innovation had to be accelerated. Um, uh, the photo, photo ID card that students had to come to campus for, we launched this, uh, this cloud-based system that students can upload their own IDs. We created dynamic websites. So we accelerated innovation. And the reason this presentation is called the pandemic of opportunities is because we took the pandemic as an opportunity to really accelerate innovation and meet students where they were. If you think about pre-pandemic, uh, the students come from an outside world where Everything is app-based, right? Uh, they do everything Uber or Amazon. They, things are so easy for the students to consume. They come into the campus, then they're going back to the 60s because we were so archaic. Many of our processes were so archaic. You stand in line on this pop print and uh, you pay fees and you do this, you do that. You go from office to office to office to get this form signed. How archaic is that? And we didn't even realize how many of these processes are so archaic for our students. So when the pandemic struck, there was so much collaboration from different departments and divisions across the campus. We just elevated all those processes. And we're never going back to uh, having students come and stand in line for our, in our campus ever again. So this is the opportunity that this pandemic created for us. So uh, I'll turn it over to Dr. Owen um, for, for the fantastic job that they did in really bringing our faculty up to speed on technology and pedagogy uh, so they could, they could uh, deliver that to our students. Thank you, Dr. Sadakar. Uh, everyone uh, hear me okay? Yep. Thank you. Uh, 
Uh, as uh, Dr. Sudakar mentioned, I'm the Director of Academic Technologies and Innovation. That is one department in our Division of Information Technology Services, uh, which Dr. Sudakar leads. And the responsibility of our department is to serve faculty in instructional design, in multimedia academic production, and in accessible technology services. So the, my portion here, I'll be focusing on uh, faculty-related uh, opportunities that the pandemic presented. <clears throat> Excuse me. So uh, the first one I'd like to focus on, as Dr. Sadakar uh, already mentioned, and I'm sure as many of you had to do, we had to pivot to fully online uh, synchronous instruction with the onset of the pandemic uh, in March and April 2020. So our seven instructional designers quickly put together uh, four or five webinars a day to provide our faculty with those best practices because, well, many of, of our instructors had never taught that way. Um, so it was really a, a, like a boot camp on, on what to do now that we're moving our classes to live online instruction. More than 300 of our approximately 1,000 faculty attended these webinars in the first few weeks. Uh, and uh, it was approximately 800 attendees uh, overall just in the first three weeks. So many of those were repeats. Uh, but we, we hope we did a good job in preparing faculty for that emergency situation. And of course, the opportunity there was to, in a very intense way, bring our faculty uh, up <coughs> to a skill level of uh, teaching in synchronous uh, online conditions, which they did not have before. So a little bit later in the pandemic, in, starting in uh, June, 2020, uh, we designed uh, three tracks of a summer virtual institute. And each of those tracks provided a faculty member with uh, more than 20 hours of training and best practices in online teaching. Now these, these trainings were focused on uh, asynchronous online teaching. In other words, preparing classes uh, well in advance of the instruction so that students can engage with the material uh, without any live instructor. So of course, as you know, that requires a, a lot of careful thought, a lot of careful planning and structuring of the online course and uh, also the use of uh, effective uh, academic technology tools to facilitate uh, students' learning and engagement. Uh, so next slide, please. The second area I'd like to focus on is a, a longer term intentional program to increase our number of quality uh, asynchronous online uh, courses. So as Dr. Sadaka mentioned, we had some of these before but now with the advent of the uh, pandemic, we really undertook an intensive focus on expanding the number of these courses uh, with the support of academic affairs and our provost. Uh, so the foundation of this, this program was a, uh, is a program in the California State University Office, Office of the Chancellor called, called Quality Online Teaching and Learning. And though this is a uh, set of standards and uh, practices in uh, asynchronous online teaching developed uh, in the CSU, and they offer courses to all faculty in the CSU. So this was our foundation. Every one of our faculty members who participated in these programs took uh, either the beginning or the intermediate uh, QLT course through the office of the chancellor, which is in Long Beach, California, about uh, 80 miles from here. Of course, these, these classes are offered online. And then the participating faculty paired with one of our seven instructional designers to develop a quality online course over a several month period. And uh, these, the, each of these courses had to meet a, the standards in a QLT course evaluation instrument. Also, the uh, participating faculty's department chair was required to commit to offer this course in an asynchronous online mode taught by the 
participating instructor uh, during the next academic year. So our focus was really on uh, delivering these courses, making these courses available so they would provide the benefits uh, of, the, of asynchronous courses to our students, which are of course that the student can attend um, free of time requirements and space requirements. They can take the course at their own convenience and still have a quality learning experience, which is the equivalent of a face-to-face -face course. And currently we have more than 100 of these quality asynchronous online courses under development. And next, please. So one of the things I want to add uh, to, uh, to Dr. Owen's comments here is that these programs, the faculty were compensated to attend these training programs. And they have specific requirements uh, that they need to complete uh, in order to become compensated. So um, we structured a program in which uh, we, we told them, if you complete these requirements, then we'll, uh, Brad, I think it was $1,000 or uh, how much did we come, 1,500? Yeah, we settled at 1,500. Yeah, and so that also gave the faculty motivation to participate in these uh, online development programs. Go ahead, please. Yes, thank you, Dr. Sadakar. The third area of focus I'd like to address is, uh, the actual physical infrastructure of our two campuses. Our larger campus in San Bernardino, California, which is about uh, 70 miles, 80 miles from east of Los Angeles, and the Palm Desert campus, which is another 70 miles east uh, from San Bernardino, our smaller uh, campus. So uh, the, the pandemic uh, made us realize we have the opportunity, as Dr. Sadakar has already uh, uh, suggested, that we could uh, provide our students who are unable to attend in person the opportunity to Zoom in remotely and attend uh, any class which is offered face-to-face -face on either campus. Uh, so we call this, uh, this approach co-synchronous teaching which is, as I've just said, is the idea that an on-site instructor with on-site students allows remote students to zoom in and get the same quality of learning experience as the on-site students. The equipment that we chose to facilitate this, uh, this environment included a ceiling-mounted pan-tilt-zoom camera, uh, which uh, the instructor can adjust the angle of to show the instructor at any position in the front of the classroom, like the podium, like uh, the center front of the classroom, or at the whiteboards at the front of the classroom. Uh, another piece of equipment is a beam forming microphone. Uh, the this so called beam forming technology focuses on an audio source in the room, such as the instructor's voice. And this yielded much better audio quality for the remote students than older technologies. Uh, we also provided touch screen monitors, uh, document cameras, and a webcam mounted on the podium. And all of these tools added up to an ability by the instructor to really reach the remote students. But of course, if this instructor is not aware of and doesn't intentionally use the equipment, uh, it's, not, it's not helpful. So we also provided on-site training for instructors in best practices in, in this co-synchronous teaching mode. The tendency will be to uh, uh, ignore or to leave out the remote students, to treat them as an afterthought. So this pedagogy of co-synchronous teaching really trains the instructor to include the remote students at every point uh, in the class and in the instructional materials and so on. These faculty participating also had to uh, complete a two-hour self-guided course in best practices in co-synchronous teaching, which um, was uh, authored quite brilliantly by Dr. Mauricio Caravid, who was with you this morning. Um, so uh, as Dr. Sadaka mentioned, one benefit of this, this, the, these NGSCs will be that students from our uh, Palm Desert campus that can attend any class offered at our San Bernardino, San Bernardino campus and actually vice versa. Any student at San Bernardino 
and attend Palm Desert on-site classes by zooming in. And next slide, please. And my last uh, topic that I'll address is learning management system. Of course, the pandemic uh, really pointed out the importance of having the best possible learning management system. And uh, as, we, as we went on in the pandemic, uh, and we'd th been thinking about this for some time, but we realized that the, the uh, LMS that we had, Blackboard, and its supposed uh, uh, next generation version, which was Blackboard Ultra, they were just not meeting our needs. They were not up to the quality that we wanted. So working with our faculty senate, we looked into the learning management system options and decided that Canvas looked like the best choice. Uh, we did a large pilot with faculty and students in Canvas last spring. And uh, the results there were very positive by both faculty and students towards Canvas. Uh, so we um, adopted uh, Canvas for a, a, a year long transition period and we're in the middle of that transition period right now. In the current term, uh, two thirds of classes which are using the learning management system site uh, are using Canvas while one third are still using Blackboard which we made available via an opt-in system. Uh, and in terms of learning management system penetration, as Dr. Sadakar mentioned before the pandemic, we had a surprisingly low uh, rate of adoption of any learning management system by our, by our instructors, even though every class was provided with learning management system site, only about uh, one third to 40% of our faculty were using an LMS. Now that has doubled post pandemic to two thirds of our current classes are using LMS sites. Um, the remaining one third, perhaps some of those are uh, on-site classes like science laboratories, uh, arts, uh, arts performance labs like music performance and theater performance. Uh, so we still have a ways to go, but we've doubled the rate of our LMS penetration. And uh, that, that does illustrate how the pandemic presented an opportunity to uh, extend the use of this very important academic uh, technology tool. That concludes my portion of the presentation and I uh, yield back to uh, Dr. Sadakar for the conclusion. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Owen. So, um, you know, when, when uh, we all were maybe five or six years ago, people always used to say, well, thank you for bringing us out of the dark ages. <laughs> and that meant, well, thank you for bringing us from the era of paper and pencil to the computer era. Thank you for putting smart classrooms and all of this kind of stuff. Only when the pandemic hit, we realized how dark ages we were still. You know, uh, We really hadn't come out of the dark ages. Uh, we were still in the dark ages for, for, uh, for many, many, many things. And the pandemic of opportunity, you know, the pandemic really devastated a lot of people's lives and families. That needs to be acknowledged. But it also showed us how backward we are as higher education institutions in terms of meeting our students at the point of their need, right? Uh, we, were, we were thinking, oh, we did do a great job. We provide all this technology and this and that and the other thing. But what we didn't realize is that from the student's perspective, we really were not hitting it out of the ballpark. If you, in a higher education institution, the most important people are students, right? And if, and they hold the scorecard. If they don't say we're successful, and, and Mauricio, I think, mentioned that during our, uh, during the plenary session, what is their um, scorecard for success? We think we do things for student success, but they need to really say. So uh, some of the things that we ro rolled out and are rolling out is, um, bridging the digital divide, right? There's a huge digital divide issue in San Bernardino region. Um, you know, more than 50% of our students really don't have access to high speed internet connection in a very affordable manner, right? Uh, there is high speed, but then they charge you $70, $80 a month, which many of our students can't afford. So we're working with regional, uh, local and regional organizations with ISPs 
to, to bring the cost to a level that our students can afford. We extended software subscriptions during the pandemic. Many of the companies actually came and said, we're going to offer all these free software subscriptions for your students, Adobe, Mathematica, all of these people came and said, we'll offer this free. We are working with them to extend those. Expansion of outdoor Wi-Fi across the campus so students can sit wherever they want and uh, access the internet and take their classes and developing more chatbots, continuing to identify and streamline processes. There are still several, several processes. You know, in fact, um, we every day we are inventorying what the students are going through. When we came back to the university after the pandemic, fall semester started were, uh, started in person at Cal State San Bernardino. And it was so easy for people to go back to their old ways. People were like, oh, we're back on campus. Now let's go on standard line. We are, we completely said, no, no, no. We are not going to stand in line. Starbucks, you can go and stand in line because you, <laughs> you, you go pay $5 for a cup of coffee. You need to stand in line. But anything else, you can't, um, you shouldn't be standing in line. And we're not going back to the old uh, archaic practices that we had. We still had many, many, uh, we still have many, many processes that students have to watch a video to, to complete. Um, our uh, registration system, we're, we're still not integrated in many areas. So these are the areas that we are focusing in on. So the students, when they come to campus, faculty and staff have an Amazon.com like experience where, when they come into our system that they don't have to watch a video or they don't have to read a manual on how to navigate through our system, systems. So that's really the focus on the future is give the students a seamless experience. One of the projects we are also working on is personalized chatbots for every student. So this personalized chatbot will learn the student, will know about the student, reside on their cell phone and tell them exactly what they need to be doing when they wake up. The chatbot is gonna wake them up at, five, at six o'clock in the morning and say, here is your cup of Starbucks and then you go to your class and here are all the assignments due, here are the uh, events that you're interested in. The chatbot is gonna customize the student experience at Cal State San Bernardino. We want every student to have a personalized experience and every student uh, consume education. And when I say consume education, our faculty take uh, offense to that fact because education is not a consumable um, uh, good, but you know, uh, our students are of the consumeristic attitude, right? We got to give them what they need in the modality that they that's more effective for them. And that's what we're shooting for. And, uh, you know, we are making great progress. There's great support from our president and our um, other administrators on campus and our faculty. So we'll continue to move forward and really not waste this pandemic of opportunity uh, to, to go back to our old ways, but really to redefine, reinvent higher education so it makes sense and meaning to our students who are, who are coming to our institution. And that's, that concludes my presentation, our presentation. Happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Sammy and Bradford, for such a great presentation and for taking the, pandem uh, the pandemic as an opportunity to accelerate innovation and focus on equity in technology and education. We invite you to take advantage of this moment and view the evaluation for this session. There is a QR code that you can scan in order to access the evaluation. And for the virtual participants, the link to the evaluation is in the chat. Please make sure you select the time and date for this session. After completing the evaluation, we will use the last 10 minutes for a Q&A. If you have a question, you can raise your hand. The virtual participants may use the chat or mute their microphone. Okay. Sure, I have a question, yes. Um, I am Stefan Jimenez from Inter-American University of Puerto Rico. Um, we all know the importance to pursue the best learning experience of the student, mm -hmm. but also the way that we serve them plays an important role for retention purposes. Could you please share your experience with the chatbot or other strategies to enhance the, the services of the online students? 
Sure. So chatbot is one of our mechanisms in which uh, that you know um, we serve our students. The chatbot is available twenty four seven, and one of the things uh, about a chatbot is it's always consistent, right? The answers that the chatbot gives doesn't vary uh, time to time. If you go into an office of three or four people and you ask this person a question, their answer might be different from uh, another colleague of theirs, even though they work in the same office. But the chatbot is gives you the consistent and correct answer every time. So uh, on the back end, you have to do a lot of work on the chatbot, right? So you have to look at questions that students, faculty, and staff are asking that the chatbot didn't know the answer for. Uh, so that's a constant. Every day we get a list of questions that the chatbot didn't know the answer for. So we have to con constantly address that. And also we have to constantly make sure that the database that the chatbot is reading from has accurate answers. So rolling out the chatbot and not uh, worrying about the back end will really come back to hurt us. So, um, and that's why we're very strategic in the rolling out of startups. So first of all, we rolled out chatbots for the technology support center uh, to answer technology questions. And then we rolled it out admissions, registration. Now we're rolling it out for, for advising. So uh, we don't have one giant chatbot. These are all little chatbots. And if this chatbot doesn't know the answer, it passes it along to another chatbot. And that chatbot takes over. And, and if you go to, if you want to experiment with that chatbot, you can go to csusb.edu um, and click on, uh, on search for financial aid or admissions or whatever, and the chatbot will pop up and start engaging with you. Nice, thank you. Yeah. Is there any other questions for Samuel and Bradford? And, and the technology support center is 24 seven as well. So they take live calls and help our students. So some students don't like chatbots, we, uh, they can call or they can come in. So we are offering all kinds of modalities for students, whichever way they're comfortable with. Okay. Yeah, we can put the... No, we don't have it, I don't think. Okay. I um so let me put the address in the chat box. I'll put put our contact information in the chat so you will have our if it's also in the program. <laughs> 